well, this is kind of an intimidating audience. <laughs> and fundamentally, that's because many of the individuals here are more knowledgeable about many of the individual populations and parts of the landscape than I am that I'm going to talk about. And also because we have many people who actually manage these populations and, and confront these challenges in their daily jobs that I have to talk a little bit about. But I'll try to do my best. Um, so um, ungulate migration, uh, I believe, is a defining feature of this system. And part of my goal has been to help uh, understand why and, and expand on our understanding of, of the importance of migration in this landscape. And you're looking here at the movements, kind of the, um, the jurisdictional, uh, well, and on top elevational um, profile of a, of a migration of one individual cow elk and the Cody elk herd on the um, east side of uh, the greater Yelson ecosystem. You would see something similar, and you will later in the talk, for other migrations but it's complex. You can see the many players that are involved um, and need to be engaged in order to understand and manage these, this phenomenon. And I just wanna say, I, one of the things I think is exciting here today is that um, you know, I look just at the GYCC's um, mission and goals. Um, uh, you, know, you see each of the federal agencies uh, that manage the lands of the GYE along that jurisdictional profile and you see a goal of the committee to um, pursue opportunities for voluntary cooperation and coordination at landscape scale. I could not think of a phenomenon in this system uh, that is more deserving and ripe for uh, that uh, attention. So I uh, applaud the GYCC for, for giving this phenomenon what I think is its due. Now first I wanna, I wanna do three things uh, in this presentation. First, provide some background and context. I mean, essentially I'm gonna try and provide the best review, overview I can of, of how we're learning about these migrations in the system. So some background and context, then some um, key advances in the basic ecology, uh, as we understand it, of these migrations and some key advances in understanding human impacts on these migrations and then and finally, a few parting thoughts. So who are these species? When we talk about migratory ungulates or hoofed mammals in this landscape and across the West, um, we're talking uh, in particular about elk, mule deer, pronghorn antelope, bison, bighorn sheep, uh, and moose. Uh, these six species have migratory or partially migratory populations where migratory individuals move between 25 and 175 miles each year. We're actually now seeing even longer movements by some individual mule deer over 200 miles in this system that we didn't really know about uh, in detail previously. So this is an exciting time learning about the migrations of these important species. What are we talking about when we're talking about migration? Uh, just to make sure we're on the same page, we're talking about movement. What we're not talking about is individuals or populations that stay in the same area in both seasons of the year. What we are talking about is individuals and populations that move some distance, we don't care how far, to a distinct set of habitats, part of the landscape for half the year. Uh, when we talk about migration, it's not to say that resident populations or short distance migrations are unimportant, but it's to recognize the special importance of, of migrants and long distance migrants and their uh, particular exposure to many different kinds of anthropogenic threats um, and challenges as we uh, make use of landscapes. The awareness of these migrations is not new at all in this system. Uh, there has been an understanding by Native Americans of uh, the importance of these species and their movements for thousands of years. Uh, there has been an awareness amongst managers of this system uh, for a century and more about these movements. On the left you're seeing uh, basically a picture from Nat Geo's coverage of the request uh, 
uh, U.S. Army General Philip Sheridan, one of the first managers of Yellowstone during the Army years, made to Congress to expand Yellowstone National Park to encompass the full year-round ranges of key elk and, and bison and other populations in 1882. We're on the right, uh, USDA circular from 1919, uh, where uh, leaders in the USDA and Department of Interior were saying a key thing about these animals in the system is migration. There's quickly a lot of change around this landscape. We gotta, we gotta spare these winter ranges somehow. And putting major land protections into place to, to, to contribute to that effort. And indeed, this is part of why we still have, why we can be here today and talk about this um, phenomenon. Uh, early research by uh, uh, folks in the biological survey, um, Olaus Murray, a key, a key one, um, spending a couple months in the thoroughfare, um, just trying to figure out with his eyeballs and looking for trails, uh, the movements of elk and deer and moose and trying to figure out how many of them moved where in the context of a presidential commission to try and see whether the boundaries of Yellowstone National Park needed to be tweaked or, uh, and so forth or on the right. The early uh, and really important studies of the Craighead, or uh, John Craighead and others, um, the University of Montana, um, uh, back when ear tagging and neck banding and maybe early VHF collaring was the only means available to do this tracking and kind of uh, search, you know, tagging these animals on winter range and then looking for those needles in a haystack on summer range, but painting the early picture that we had of these movements. Uh, or long-term studies, including by people who are here today from the Elk Refuge, from Yellowstone National Park um, and other agencies on the Jackson and the northern herds and other populations uh, from which we've learned a lot about these movements. So this awareness is not new. And conservation activity, as I've already alluded to, is not new uh, around migrations. Um, and, and I you know, could, could spend a long time get providing you examples, but here I'll just reference the you know, habitat management areas in the three states that have um, been situated in places uh, very important to, especially the winter ranges of these migratory herds um, or easements done um, um, through partnerships or directly by uh, state wildlife agencies to federal and state protections of uh, seasonal restrictions on um, disturbance in um, key habitats, especially winter ranges, to uh, harvest management to try and make sure that harvest um, isn't um, um, uh, disproportionately impacting uh, migrants or long distance migrants over residents and so forth. So this is, again, uh, this is a, a long, uh, we're, 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 we're on a long um, an historic arc here as we think about these migrations um, in this landscape, both in terms of science and conservation. So what's changed? You know, why are you having to hear about this a bunch recently? Um, well, I think uh, a lot of things have changed, but I'll offer a few really key ones. Technology, you know, think about all the technology that's led to us, you know, using these. The same trends have, have led to um, just incredible advances in our ability to see animal movements across the landscape, use remote sensing to understand where those animals are going and, and, and take a stab at why or learn why. Um, and, the, and, and then gradually the computational analyses catching up to these enormous data streams and challenges um, and, and a bit of a lag effect between the technology of GPS collars coming on and those methods, you know, getting sorted out. That's a big change um, in recent years. I think a global sense um, that you can see in many places. Here's a recent publication in the you know, premier scientific journal in the world showing around the world across, I think, 60 some species when you map animal movements, including migrations, but not limited to migrations, home range sizes and things onto an index of human footprint, uh, we see uh, significant reductions in just the scale of animal movements closer and closer to significant human activity.
for various reasons. So this, this trend in scientific understanding and interest and awareness, especially in the vulnerability of, of animal movements to, to change. Um, and, uh, and storytelling ability. And so now you're seeing um, digital cameras that you can carry around easily and you're seeing a lower bar for getting stories independently produced onto media platforms. And so you're seeing the conversion or the movement of this awareness from the minds of sort of the experts and the residents and the, you know, the, the folks who are intimately familiar with the system out into the wider world in a way that's feeding back on um, uh, what people want to want to see and hear more about. And so I think these are all really important trends. Um, and I think the GYE is in the spotlight, one, because we've had the resources, the agencies have had the resources uh, to, to use this technology um, because there's a lot of interest in what's still here and these special movements um, amidst these global trends and, and so forth. So I think that's what's changed and that's what's uh, thrust this topic into much more of a, a sort of a limelight than has been in the past perhaps. What about sort of what we're learning about the ecology of migrations? I could talk about a lot of things globally. I'm going to try to just give you examples from the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And it turns out actually there's a lot of globally significant learning, uh, as always, that's been happening here. Well, simply, as, as Charlie uh, indicated, we're just learning about things we either didn't know much about or didn't maybe even didn't know about. Here's the a uh, well-known path of the pronghorn, um, uh, move, movement of pronghorn antelope from areas near Pinedale, Wyoming, up to right across from where we're sitting today, 120 miles or so, um, stitched together um, by Wyoming and Fish Department, by uh, University of Wyoming, by WCS, back in the, uh, um, in, over the last several decades. Um, and then imagine what it was like for people who study this phenomenon when it turned out after decades of attention in this area, um, a colleague, Hal Sawyer, who thinks he's studying a resident deer herd down near Rock Springs, Wyoming, finds out that several thousand of these deer are moving right under everybody's noses amidst all this focus on this pronghorn migration. And so this sense of, whoa, you know, what what's going on here that we're, we're missing, uh, we need to understand better. So discovery and documentation of these, uh, of these movements. Um, and um, I would say also um, sort of a different, you know, spin on the discovery process, you know, elk migrations that I've worked on with colleagues in the agencies, um, really to just draw together much of the existing data on populations that we know a lot about and, and many people know a lot about, but uh, that we haven't seen in um, this new, this level of detail, that we haven't um, um, seen um, in aggregate and, and studied in aggregate. And so even when we've understood a phenomenon, seen it, uh, sort of this recognition of how much more we have to, to understand about it. Um, so, um, and I think, I guess, I guess here's as good a place as any to say it. it and when we look back at um, these pronghorn and deer movements, these are important. They're important because they're inspiring. They're aesthetically beautiful. They're important to particular, to every management unit in the area for different reasons. Um, but then also when we see something like the scale and the sort of number of animals involved in something like the sort of mass elk migrations, and you start thinking about the multi-species dimension in this, we're starting to talk about a bigger, more profound um, phenomenon involving you know, millions of pounds of biomass moving in and out of core areas of the system each year. So I think a sense of the scale of this phenomenon um, taking hold. So, um, um, I think we've been, we've been seeing new, we've, we've had new insights into the, the, the causes and the benefits of migration. Uh, early work actually in, um, in areas of Africa where Charlie uh, works, um, 
in the late 1980s were the original sort of seminal studies that said, why are these animals migrating and how does it contribute to their abundance? At that time, all this, this information, this technology wasn't available. The hypotheses were um, basically, if you translate them to this landscape, they get access by moving to these other areas of landscape, whether it's a wet season range or a high elevation summer range, to new and emerging plant growth in greater quantities at a higher level of quality than they do by staying behind. And in so doing, they might also kind of get some temporary relief from predation, especially by denning predators that set up shop back on the winter or the dry season range. And so these kind of dual um, benefits of migration had always been thought to be important, and there's been a lot of evidence accumulating. There was secondly this idea that you know, these dual benefits may actually really um, mean that migrants, ex help explain why migrants in many landscapes histor historically were more abundant than their resident counterparts. They're able to get fatter, reproduce at higher rates, achieve higher abundances, um, and there's some evidence to support that, at least in some contexts. Um, with our modern sort of technology, we can start digging into this further, and um, and uh, a really important um, hypothesis that's been accumulating support uh, in recent years is called the um, the forage maturation hypothesis. So, if you think about the biomass of a grass or a forb or a shrub, uh, over time it's growing up, it gets less protein and more structural tissue over the course of the growing season. And so um, the, uh, the amount that uh, an ungulate can consume uh, if it hangs around and waits for the mature growth is much greater, but the value and the digestibility of that plant tissue drops. And so there, there's this thought that there's an optimal level uh, of intermediate biomass where the quality is still high uh, that these animals should be seeking out. And, uh, and so the, the energy intake um, that they experience is greatest at this intermediate level of biomass. And so we can begin to make predictions about how they're gonna move across the landscape looking for these intermediate uh, stages of plant growth. And then we got satellite imagery and this thing called normalized difference vegetation index which is basically greenness measured from space and it's well correlated and proven uh, out to relate strongly to biomass and so we can use plant biomass we can use that um, to, 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 to test these questions and, and so a lot of the work that's been happening especially in, especially and in including in the GYE uh, has done this. And uh, essentially uh, what I'm showing you here is that, um, you know, if you look at the greenness curve in dark, um, in the dark line in this figure, what you're looking at is the, essentially the accumulation of greenness of plant biomass over the course of the growing season from spring through summer and then browning down into the autumn. And you see that peak in uh, the rate of green up uh, on the patches that are selected, that are visited by different species of ungulates, in this case moose, bighorn sheep, bison, mule deer, um, they're all selecting somewhere around that intermediate plant biomass. And we've had other studies that have shown migrants surf the green, green wave more closely, that it, um, it, it may contribute in some cases to their accumulation of body fat. And so there have been a lot of new insights to suggest, um, yes, migration uh, is, is really beneficial in terms of uh, individual survival, reproduction, uh, and in comparison with animals that don't migrate. Um, we've also had some really basic advances in our ability to just map these migrations. So not only historically did we kind of have to do the needle in the haystack thing, but even in the early days of GPS collaring, we were just you know, connecting dots across the map. Well, now uh, methods have been worked out by colleagues uh, like Hal Sawyer and, and Matt Kaufman and others in Wyoming to, to basically take the rate of movement and the turning angles of these animals while they're moving 
and create probability surfaces that give us a, a probability uh, that the animal used um, an area of the landscape while it was moving. And, and that is really important if you're trying to manage habitat, right? Because you go from a, a line on a map to a two-dimensional surface that actually means something in the context of management. And then we can scale that up from individuals kind of averaging to the population level and pick out high use corridors. In this case, you're seeing those in red versus lower use or, or high use corridors and stopovers uh, and, and lower use areas in kind of yellow and brown in this figure. That's been a really important advance that feeds into many other things that we've been seeing. Um, new insights into the importance of seasonal habitats. So uh, here's the movement of one doe mule deer across uh, a landscape in southern Wyoming from a winter inch on the bottom left to a summer inch on the right. You can see these clumps of locations and then uh, long you know, kind of movement corridors between them. And so what we've start to understand these as are stopovers, um, stopover habitats, uh, which these animals um, use more and more of the further that they're, they're migrating. So that's what this figure is showing you. But importantly that um, these animals are spending up to, in the case of mule deer, up to 95% of their time in these stopovers and only 5% in the movement corridor. So we can start to say, okay, key places along the corridor are more, more important than others. And again, uh, important for management. Um, and this has actually been one, uh, this, I wanna sort of highlight this, this notion that the movement corridors between seasonal ranges are habitat in their own right is really an important insight of, of recent work in the system. And so, what about some of our advances in understanding human impacts on some of these species and populations? Well, we just know from historical accounts that key migrations have been lost or severely curtailed. We can, many of us can think of bison, loss of major bison migrations. Many of us can point to examples where we know even though uh, happily we retain significant elk migrations, uh, key portions of those migrations have been lost. Um, and so, yes, we've, we, there have been a lot of, of losses and we don't even know what some of them have been. But what are we learning now uh, about the details of sort of how different human impacts can affect these? Um, we know that if um, we have high intensity uh, development such as this natural gas development in the Upper Green River Basin near Pinedale, we know from the work of Hall Sawyer and others over 15 or maybe 17, uh, some 15 years, that um, on winter ranges, uh, you know, we can measure how uh, far these animals were from areas that got developed um, before development, which is, which is not far because they were using those as habitat. We can see during development, they start to have an average distance much further away from those uh, drill rigs and well pads. And uh, we can see that that effect has been maintained. You're looking at um, essentially a summary of 15 years of data. And in the last three years on the right, you can see there hasn't been habituation. This effect hasn't diminished over time. Uh, it's actually still operating quite strongly. And we can see long-term uh, decline of a, some 30, 30, 35% in the abundance of this herd. We know they haven't moved elsewhere. Um, and so it probably has to do with the effects of indirect habitat loss uh, on these winter ranges. Uh, we know um, about effects of human activity or risks posed by human activity on migration corridors. For example, if we look at that long um, red desert to hoback or sublet uh, deer herd migration, there, that has components of residents, short distance, medium distance, long distance migrants. And when we look at some of the obvious sort of uh, human um, barriers and, 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 and exposure they may face differentially, um, just to highlight, say, fences, we can see short distance migrants don't climb over any and long distance migrants cross 171. 
um, on average. And so we can see how you know, we can really start diminishing the uh, proportional abundance of these longer distance migrants in one of these populations. And it's not just fences, it's roads, it's how long they're exposed to harvest as they move through many different uh, areas in the fall that have uh, open hunting seasons and, and so forth. Um, we can see that in areas of, um, again, high intensity development, um, in migration corridors, uh, we can see um, essentially um, increased movement rates through these areas. Now you know stopovers are important, probably as foraging and resting areas. We can see reduced use of those stopover habitats. We don't know very well what the physiological consequences are, but we can see that uh, occurring. And uh, when we look at the elk herds, we're seeing in many different areas, um, these, when we sort of change how risks and rewards are distributed across landscapes, uh, we can see uh, shifts in the proportion of residents versus migrants in herds. And often what we're seeing, uh, we don't understand it uh, as well as we want to yet, is that in these low elevation winter ranges, we're often, we've got, well, feeding across the way, but many other areas, alfalfa and hay fields um, that these animals can access. We have uh, lethal control of predators or avoidance by predators of, you know, ranches and roads and, and other things. And, and these animals exploiting those areas uh, as refuge. And when we combine those, we, we think we might be really, um, you know, changing, flipping the benefits of migration in some cases to resident animals. I think there's, there's much work to be done here, but but it's another important piece of the puzzle. So um, with my last few minutes, um, I just wanna offer some concluding thoughts. I mean, um, the managers are here, so it's really on you. One thing I've learned that's awkward about my job is you spend years with wildlife and land managers saying, why don't you do work that's more relevant to what we do and then you do some of it, and then some of them start saying, why don't you stop talking about <laughs> how we do our jobs? So we're always trying to find that balance. You know, bear with me. Um, uh, and I just want to offer some general thoughts. But um, you know, evidence from the, the, the GYE and beyond, migration matters. It matters a lot. It might be a significant reason why we get the abundance of ungulates we do. In many landscapes, including this one, uh, there's really good evidence for that. Um, and in turn, while I think sort of the economic impacts and ecosystem services associated with migration have not been well studied, um, it's fairly reasonable to assume that that abundance tied to these animals' use of multiple habitats through the year is part of what allows the surplus uh, an abundance and productivity that sustains harvest, uh, uh, large carnivore and scavenger communities, um, tourism and recreation in places like the national parks, all at the same time. Um, and so um, this process of migration, I think we, we need to be asking uh, whether it's really you know, that fundamental to, to, this, to this system. Um, it, it touches many things people care about. Um, my experience has been, and I'm sure much, many of you have had this experience as well, as we've learned how to sort of tell this story, um, we see that there's a lot of interest in the public. Uh, it's, I think migrations uh, are, are interesting and fascinating and mysterious and inspiring to people. I think there's a sense that there's broad support uh, everybody wants these to persist. I mean, that doesn't mean it's easy to figure out how, um, but in a time and in a, sometimes in a place where it's hard to find kind of good news and, and, and stories about a partnership and collaboration, this is one that offers that opportunity. And, and, and there's a lot of interest, I think. Um, we see it, you know, when Joe Reese would, if he were here, my photography uh, collaborator, he would tell you, I made this four minute film about these mule deer um, 
and six million now, eight or 10 million people have watched it. Who would have thought? Who, who would have thought that? Uh, it was just to him, to him almost overwhelming uh, the degree of interest in this movement of mule deer. You know, National Geographic um, seems to know, uh, people like Christian seems to know what interests people. And, uh, and, and so, uh, w you know, through that uh, venue and like the best selling issue of National Geographic in however many years, the, the migration story was uh, at least one part of that that seemed to have resonance. Um, but we've also sort of had the experience of trying to engage in this story at more local levels. The museum exhibit you'll see here was a real effort to try and connect the story to you know, communities in this landscape and around the West. Please go look at it. If you knew how much pain it caused me to co-curate that exhibit, you would all go look at it um, <laughs> just to be nice. Um, but it hopefully also is, is, is compelling. Uh, or workshops and convenings we've done uh, with uh, private landowners with the assistance of the Western Landowners Alliance. You'll hear more from them on the panel later um, to really try and bring something really simple back to private landowners are utterly key in this story. Just bringing back some recognition that these private lands are absolutely, they're 30% of the ecosystem. They're some of the richest parts of the landscape and they're they're holding up a lot of, of, of this, especially when it comes to these migratory ungulates. And so China, we, and those, those have all been welcomed um, and, and had good responses from the community. So there seems to be public and stakeholder interest. And, you know, and then you should see the response when the Wyoming Migration Initiative has a mule deer that's doing something interesting like moving 200 miles you know, from Rock Springs to Idaho. Um, there's a lot of interest there. Um, Conserving these migrations is obviously necessarily collaborative. Um, I guess the question I would pose is when there's a development or a subdivision on this piece of private land on an elk migration, um, is it only the immediate local groups that should be trying to, to, to address that problem? Or, or, or is there an interest of everybody who, 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 who lives and works and and manages land and wildlife along that migration to be involved. Um, there are ch big challenges there, but how can that happen? And the same is true of, you know, when there's an invasive species in the park or disease issue that's changing, you know, grizzly bear diets and gonna influence um, uh, how much, uh, you know, migratory elk calves grizzly bears eat, you know, having some awareness of those transboundary effects and collaboration on them, um, seems inherent in the challenge uh, around these migrations. And I think that's one of the exciting things about uh, today. Um, but I think there's a great big need for prioritization. We're getting all this information. We need to figure out some priorities that people can coalesce around and how to assess uh, the needs and opportunities um, in a systematic way. Uh, and I think that's hopefully something that GYCC and its partners it's increasingly engaging with can ooh, contribute to. I think um, I'll mention this secretarial order from the Department of Interior in just a moment, but what an opportunity. I mean, the, the information in this landscape is perhaps greater than anywhere else in the world in terms of the uh, amount of movement information we have on the number of migratory ungulates in a, in a large landscape. I, I didn't have time, nor do I have the expertise, to know the extent of the data for all of these species. So I just did this crude, you get uh, up to four stars for my <laughs> gut feeling about how much data there is. And for elk, it's really good. For mule deer, it's quickly getting uh, really good. For pronghorn, it's pretty good. For bison, it's, well, it's, it's, it, I think it's very good, bighorn sheep. So there's a great deal of information available that hasn't been um, sort of uh, aggregated and, 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 and invoked in a prioritization and kind of assessment process in the ecosystem. You're the people who can discuss whether and how that's appropriate and, and how to do it. There's been so much exciting progress with the on the ground activities, you know, you can see some of them, the, 
overpasses and underpasses, the conservation easements on bottlenecks and seasonal ranges. Um, and I think you're starting to see it scale up. There's been the Secretary of or Order that Brian Glasspell mentioned. There's been um, the Wyoming Game and Fishes, um, pretty unique in terms of the Western states uh, policy around migration corridors that's just are coming into implementation. And there have been proposals like uh, the one Albert Summers had in the legislature this session that aren't mature proposals, um, but are ways in which we're seeing kind of local bottom-up ideas about, wait, how could we you know, use the interest in the parks to sort of feed back onto how we do conservation um, of these migration corridors. So um, that's the GYCC challenge. And I look forward to hearing folks talk about that. And there are always too many groups to thank, but these are some of them. Um, I think today one I really want to single out um, is the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Scott Talbot's here um, as the director of Game and Fish. Um, I think there are many ways in which the Game and Fish Department has essentially initiated a lot of the fundamental work we're talking about sometimes quietly by sort of humble biologists and game wardens that don't you know, wanna um, take it all the way and look for people like me or Hal Sawyer or Matt Kaufman or others to, to help do that. Um, but there's just been tremendous investment by that agency that's kind of brought us to this place in Wyoming, uh, as well as uh, the other states who've shared information and, and cooperation and collaboration and, and the many funders. And, institutions like National Geographic and Buffalo Bill Center that have said, um, I had someone from Nat Geo several years ago tell me, um, gosh, you're, you're, you, it was me and a couple other people, you're the first few people in a long time to convince any of us that ungulates are interesting. <laughs> that was kind of weird, but, um, but appreciate that recognition and, and support in helping kind of tell the story. So. With that, thanks, and I went a little longer than I meant to, but I think we've got some time for questions. Thank you very much. Any, anybody? Hi. Um, can you talk a little bit about how predators fit into the surf in the green? And what about, um, say, when a wolf dens, do they miss out on the stream of animals then? Or how does that fit? Well, uh, I can answer it a bit. Fortunately, we have a carnivore expert here who, will, who can speak more to those questions. But in the work, the little bit of work I've been involved in, um, like in the Clark's Fork herd, um, you know, wolves are territorial, and so, you know, when the elk herd or most of the elk herd picks up and moves 40 miles or 60 miles away, um, well, not only are they sort of stuck servicing their own offspring while the elk go get theirs some fresh, you know, green grass, um, but those wolves uh, have other packs that, that are going to limit their ability to really follow those migrants. We did see in the Clark's Fork herd, it was Abby Nelson's work as a master's student, she works for FWP now, um, that, that the wolves that occupied the winter range did, when the pups got mobile, they tended to go take them to rendezvous sites towards where the migratory elk were, and they made extraterritorial forays pretty frequently into what was the upper Lamar, um, into the territories of other packs and, and you know, brought, brought calf elk back, um, basically. Um, so that's the only direct observations I have. Um, I've seen just anecdotally that, um, you know, when we see elk crossing in the Cody herd, you know, a particular 12,000 foot, 11,800 foot pass that they've got to go over in spring when there's still deep snow up there, and you know you can see them humping through the snow with sometimes calves. The only other critter you see up there at that time of year is grizzly bears, and you see quite a few of them. So, um, you know, presumably they're taking advantage of that. 
vulnerability, that brief period where those animals are having to move through a challenging space and get bogged down in snow and things like that. So um, I'll leave it at that, but just a few observations. I noticed white-tailed deer aren't in the mix in your talk. Are they a non-migratory species? Yeah, should I have included, PJ, should I have <laughs> included white-tailed Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't include white-tailed deer. I should have, and we have people here like PJ White from Yellowstone who could, are there, um, do you see significant movements of white-tailed deer in, the, in and around the park? Okay. Yeah, so we don't we don't know very well and they're somewhat recent arrivals. They certainly are in other uh, areas of the country and, and the region. Arthur, we saw from your slides how important private lands are in, in the, the whole migration corridors and system. And um, I see GYCC, you know, the major entities in that are the federal agencies. I know mm -hmm. the states are involved, but uh, are the private landowners in some way involved since they're so critical? Uh, and, and if not, how can we reach out to them to get them more involved? Um, you know, currently the, the general attitude is anti-federal government, but uh, once people learn and listen to the science and facts, I've seen uh, many of the private landowners uh, sort of cross the fence, if you will, and, and, and want to be yeah. involved. So how, how do we get them more engaged and, and up to speed? I think it starts by kind of reframing how we think a little bit to recognize that they have been really involved in many cases. Um, and so, um, you know, when you look at like the Hoodoo Ranch or the Pitchfork Ranch or others that I've worked on and around in the winter range of the Cody Elk Herd. I mean, these are people that are essentially co-managing, you know, one of the most robust and important migratory elk herds that spends its summer in Yellowstone National, you know, in one of the wildest parts of Yellowstone National Park. And there's really not many people who know that. Um, those are places that have been maintained intact uh, in ways and by actions that I, I don't even fully understand, but they have not been broken up. They have not been, you know, had many of the things happen to them that we often essentially accuse private landowners of constantly wanting to do. We need to have a more nuanced understanding of the role of private landowners and a recognition of their huge, many of those landowners' huge investment over time, the good news about that is that's pretty easy to do, right? I mean, part of your question is to say, is saying, well, how do we get stuff going and get projects and activities? But a big first step is to do more recognizing of that past role, because that's a big part of what's gonna open the conversation. I think a second thing is how do maps, like the ones I go around with and others we all do, how do maps go from being something that's bad news to something that's good news? That's a big, that's not a GYE problem, that's a big conservation challenge, I think broadly. You know, maps often mean, okay, now my place is on this map in the footprint of this thing that other people think is important. Um, but I think, you know, I would note, you know, who's probably not, or maybe hopefully represented here, but may not be is, where does NRCS and you know the private landowner programs of the Fish and Wildlife Service, the states have robust private lands programs. Clearly those are you know doing good things, but maybe have a bigger role to be sought and invited in this system. But then I would also leave the, some of that discussion to the people who actually are and represent landowners on the panel later. But I think we gotta, ref <laughs> we gotta reframe some of how we think and talk about the role of the private landowner. And I think the anti-federal thing too, I mean, there's a lot, you say that Steve, but I mean, I find, yeah, there's a lot of skepticism, but you know, if you're honest with people and you kind of try to you build trust, you know, a lot of that falls away, but we don't do that a lot. 
Maybe Hi. One, maybe one more question? Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, it was really great to see the science illustrated and the storytelling. Um, I have a policy question, which is... Uh-oh. I think applicable given the audience today and how many um, influential people we have in the room. And that's regarding the secretarial order, um, which is really heartening. At the same time, and it was clear from one of your slides, we have oil and gas leasing today proposed in the Red Desert to Hoback Mule Deer Migration Corridor um, from the same agency um, that the secretarial order um, addresses. So I think that you're right that these corridors are inspiring and popular. Um, I just hope that there's an opportunity after today to get all of us to also take some mm -hmm. action and to turn that enthusiasm into a message to the BLM um, that these corridors matter and we don't want to see development happen. Well, I'll let uh, people who are smarter and more experienced and more diplomatic than I know how to be address <laughs> some of that um, because they're here. Um, but I also think, you know, some of these things unfold slowly and, uh, you know, I've, I gather that there's been some um, activity even around some of that very issue recently and maybe Director Talbot can speak, speak to some of that. Um, uh, so I'll leave that for you later. Is that all right? Um, but I, I, I um, you know, including actions by the governor that, that Director Talbot can probably speak to. Um, I think uh, it's also important, I'm just gonna say, I think I, it's a, something I didn't really, you know, I, I sort of skipped over, but we don't really understand either. I think I wanna, you know, there are many reasons why people use these landscapes and I'm not gonna stand here and sort of engage in acting like oil and gas development and energy development is an, an important one that's important to the economy and livelihoods of people around this region. Um, and so there's multiple use mandates and balances to be had and all that and that's for other people to address. Um, one of the things I've observed is that, um, you know, on some of the pr private lands on the east side of the GYE, low density development is part of what has kept some of those lands intact because that's part of the portfolio of, of revenues that those landowners can receive. Um, what we don't understand well is sort of the threshold effects. I mean, we clearly know the adverse impacts that can occur with high intensity development, but as a scientist, I just want to point out that I think we need to be careful about sort of saying, you know, oh, whenever there's oil and gas development, it's, you know, it's going to destroy these migrations. But in the areas we're talking about, there's high intensity development going on and others will be better to speak about what's happening and some of the thinking around that. Okay, I think, think we're done. Uh, th thanks.